Exciting times. Welcome to the Property Talk Show. And you know what I mean? Like, I actually have to open his profile here so you guys understand who I'm sitting with. Like, share, subscribe, become a part of the family. For those of you guys who have not subscribed, subscribe. And don't forget to switch on that notification bell so you get to know whenever we're dropping videos. Some of you guys who are on TikTok, he, he needs no introduction. I'm sure you always bump into his videos. He's a financial services entrepreneur with more than 16 in financial technology industry and in real estate. What do they mean about more than 16? He'll explain to us just now. But he's a registered financial advisor. He's licensed by the FSCA in the country, which is a body that regulates anything financial in this country. It used to be FSB back in the days. He's also registered as a property practitioner with um, PPRA. He's a licensed um, property developer. He is an incredible knowledge. And he's also working as a financial markets analyst who has appeared on several TV shows on SABC, multi-choice channels, analyzing financial credit, property, and debts. He's a newspaper columnist as well. Some of you guys might have heard him on the radio on Cozy FM. You might have seen him on social media sharing knowledge and educating people you might have attended his seminars he's also an author of several money books he's got awards alfred duma local municipality lady smith ambassador lions den business awards first in the best youth business category sab kickstart business awards best emerging business in kzn Umiya Zane Business Awards, Best Young Entrepreneur. Umiya Zane Business Awards, Best Emerging Business. Future Leaders Awards, Best IT Leadership. Smart Exchange Business Awards, IT Leadership Awards. His resume is too long, guys. I can go on and on and on. Wealth Management, his Moonstone Business School um, qualifications, Financial Markets and Instruments, Hedge Fund Academy, Foundations of Financial Markets, University of Pretoria, Real Estate, NQF Level 4 and Level 5, South African Real Estate Academy, Bitcoin Certificate, Virtual Currencies, University of Pretoria. Sure, 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 sure. Guys, it's very long. Like, I'll just have to cut it here. But I'm just excited to finally sit down with him. I'm one of his fans. I follow him online. I learn a lot from him. And I decided, I think there's a lot for us to learn from him on this property talk show. But I think he also needs to become a friend of the show because of the vast knowledge that he possesses. I think there's a lot we can learn from him. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Butsboni Somchali. Welcome to our property talk show, which is proudly brought to you by Ekasi Noble Property Development. Yes. I'm brand new in the property space. I'm learning. I follow people like yourself, and I kind of felt Guti. But Ning Abanto Guti, they watch our podcast, whom I think um, might be interested to learn from an incredible person like you. Yes, thank you. And Ning Abanto Guti, maybe let's make it a property begin beginners masterclass masterclass basically condenses as much information as possible into one hour because you've got so much knowledge that your knowledge cannot all be told in an hour tell me before just a summary and how did you get into um all right um I come as one from Charlie, uh, all the way from Kesaren, uh, based in Durban now. So, um, let me start by actually explain what actually led me into a uh, property industry, all right? Um, and as well as financial industry. Obviously, after finishing matric, I didn't uh, go to university the following year. So I joined the insurance industry. So I was busy in terms of insurance sales and earning commission and stuff until I get something that can help me to finance my studies. All right. But at some point, there was a time where everything was starting to go well in terms of business and um, uh, things started to go south. And uh, I was evicted by Umasta and Uwami Alesus Khan, you understand? So I remember when I was sitting outside with all my... Uh, furniture and plastic, black plastic, everything put inside. And I said to me, you know what, uh, this is not on. 
I want uh, what I call property ownership. So from that time, I decided to join one of the big real estate companies uh, in South Africa just to learn, to absorb the systems in terms of um, working as an estate agency. At the very same time, I was also enrolling for uh, level four and five in real estate, of which I've done successfully. All right, so when I was inside the industry, uh, I saw that more especially our people do not understand most of the things that now I get to absorb inside the industry. All right, so that's, that's, that's how I started to grow into uh, property development, just to diverse, because property and real estate is very a big and a diverse industry, you understand? But on the other side, what led me to uh, to go back to insurance investment industry, because uh, by that time I was already out focusing in the technology sector, but uh, simply because of like making good money, but failing to manage it properly, that led me to study wealth management, okay? The purpose was to manage my funds and the business in a proper way. But at the end of the day, I find myself um, loving uh, talking about my experiences um, in terms of how uh, I actually mess up financially. And uh, the only way that actually drive me to financial success was becoming a loyal student of money. You know, growing up, knowing that sometimes even going to church, you get things like money is the root of all evil, you know. You have that conditioning that uh, automatically uh, makes you to repel something that costs money. So it makes you to decide every now and then when you got money, you must make sure you take decisions that helps you part ways with that money as fast as possible so that you will actually be in the right stand with God. You know, all those things were actually upbringing or something that were actually conditioning my mind when I was growing up. Right. So that is when I said, I, you know what, uh, with our people in the townships and rural space, we have this mentality of seeing money in a negative way and that alone is one of those uh, what i call money rejection complex that we actually apply unconsciously because of the upbringing conditioning that we we have so that is why now we are passionate about teaching people about property opp opportunities teaching people about how to better uh, manage their monies and make even more comfortable why Mele won't come to us in a property? Zanzi, when we have this cry, a yom sab. You know, I always say, if ever you are actually living and um, you do not own a piece of land, that means you are homeless. You know, you and a street kid are actually identical. You are the same. You understand? Because uh, there's, that, that is the uh, ultimate legacy. If ever you think of my qualification, it's not something I can give it to my children when I'm no more, but something that I can create an appreciating legacy is land, land ownership, is the property, and it's always appreciating value most of the time. So that's one of the most important thing, that wealth is actually land ownership. That's one of the most important thing, and I so wish that it becomes even a subject. Real estate and property, I so wish that in, in high school or even at a dictionary level, it becomes actually a normal subject that uh, kids growing up, they discuss that I can own every other asset, but the most ultimate one is land ownership. Because without land, it means any other thing, any other asset we have may actually be depleted. What is the easiest way for anyone to get into either land ownership or property ownership? You know, I will start by coming from a rural background, you know. The easiest way is the rural land. And people, they undermine the rural land. And we have foreigners coming in, Asians coming in, and they are targeting the rural land. Uh, I'm happy to see people from uh, like Venda. They are doing great things in terms of uh, rural development, of which is very good and fantastic. There are other areas in Deben, uh, like uh, Abu Mbumbulu, they are also doing good and now their properties are at the range of 900 to 1.5 million of which in terms of value of which is good and it shows that if ever you own piece of land that land is valuable because i'm of the view that is tj Swu, uh, you cannot have a farm that is worth 4 million and the neighbors of that particular farm in the rural space their properties or land is valueless it can't be like that how come that white person farm is worth it, seven million, and the neighbors just around the farm, the value is not is not there because they are saying there are no services. It doesn't work like that. You understand? So the easiest way 
if ever you have a, a access to the rural land, grab some. That's one of the few things I will say. The second thing that is actually easier for any individual to enter the property market as a form of investing is what we call real estate investment trust. Real estate investment trust is where you are actually buying an, a fraction of a share in a retail uh, shopping center or property like a mall or so. And when you look at a real estate investment trust, they are actually uh, very cheap at the moment. They are very discounted due to the fact that there was this looting thing. There was also uh, COVID that actually uh, drive the economy down. So at this moment is the easiest one that is very much uh, discounted. People, if they can check uh, property malls like um, uh, because I'm coming from Deben, I'll make an example with Umla's Mega City. That equity is around two rand, all right, per share. So if ever you are saying, let me get into a property space and the entry level is to just buy that uh, frictional ownership in that particular mall in your neighborhood so that you protect it. You know, if ever people of uh, different townships knew about a frictional ownership in those shopping center settings, I don't think they would have banned and looted those establishments because they will be part owners. They will protect it because they are actually benefiting from those structures in their township. That's the second level that is actually easier to be a part of. And the third one is what I call, in terms of property, is um, collective buying. You know, if people come together and say, as um, like for instance, a bank like FNP has come with an option where 10 friends who are coming together, they can actually apply for collective property ownership. Once approved, they can be uh, friends or family owners on that particular property. That is another way of getting into the market because it's the easiest one and you have those partners as friends and staff. And another trend that I also recommend is the ones of the property stock fell like that. As long as you have a good, uh, what we call, a policy document, a good constitution, and uh, the good and the proper way of managing the structure. I think that will be the easiest way because obviously property is expensive, but if ever you approach as a as some form of crowdfunding or a stock file, something like that, then there will be a greater benefit. Then from there you can grow. Remember, Spoo, there were establishments like um, Natal Building Society. It was called NPS that end eventually became part of NetBank. They started as a collective society with an aim of, uh, in, in terms of a collective, get into a property space. There was allied building society. Obviously that was started by uh, the whites in that particular time. That ended up becoming an allied bank. I think it ended up being part of APSA. But they started as a collective. You know, because sometimes if ever your credit score doesn't allow you to get approved for the bond, then starting as a collective, I think it will be a way to go. I always make an example when I speak and share these experiences with people and say, if ever as a group of friends, we are able to put some 500 rand so that we can take a trip to Deben just to enjoy. How about we put a thousand rand as a collective? Uh, if you have like, I always make an example, even in the church uh, settings where like 1,000 members, if ever 1,000 members of a particular organization or a setting can just come together and say, we'll just contribute 1,000 rand, put a 1,000 rand, that will be a million. That is the power of the, uh, the, the, the crowd, whereby you have a certain vision and there's enough money for everyone in this world. It's a matter of people, when it comes to every other thing, they can come and be collective. But when it comes to creating assets and building, I think they need to be sensitized so that they will actually start to think even in those matters and say, yes, you know what, we can actually blow a thousand rand smoking or drinking and having fun, of which is not a bad thing. But how about in the next following month, we actually collectively put together a thousand rand as a group of like 500 people, that is half a million. So if you do that constantly, eventually you can be able to be in a position to buy maybe a downtown property, even cash. You start from there, that is a, what we call like a fractional ownership or group ownership. You start from there and grow. Obviously, you need to be guided by 
good policy document and constitution. But it's one of the few things that I always encourage that if ever you are to get into a property market, sometimes it becomes easier if you get as like like as a as a as a, as a tribe where like with your scheme or with your team, something like that. That is what we always encourage because it becomes an easier way of getting a certain piece of ownership. Then you can grow from there as you understand and get some experience within the property ownership space. And then, yeah, so Nipuguti, because it's an interview from time to time, you'll speak and pause so yeah. that I come in. I don't want you to feel like you have to keep quiet. <laughs> I just want you to go on because yeah, I want us to pour out as much knowledge as possible when I'm for it. Because yeah. social media, I'm already glued. And I don't want to uh, but in limit you. So yeah. this is a platform where we are teaching. It's an educational platform. So as much knowledge as you think on this episode, Abantu Melba is, as I was saying, guys, it's not going to all happen on this episode. He will need to come back multiple times. <laughs> the amount of knowledge that this man has, yeah. it's an ama he's amazing. And in Tanda, he even teaches Nesizulu, you know? He's yeah. not one of those people that forced to teach in English. He'll speak in your vernacular language, but he will simplify the information, which is what Ngukhloni Pangako, I love love how you, you are passionate about teaching, you are passionate about helping Abantu. Uh, I think that's your purpose, that's your calling. And thank you for using all these platforms to share your knowledge when I'm for it. Great. You know, when I was evicted, actually I was evicted two times, ne? and because I was actually failing to keep up with the rent. I told myself that it's a painful experience. You know, you know sometimes when you are actually outside there and your problems are public, it's actually humiliating. But I told myself that from now going forward, I will observe every information and knowledge in terms of property ownership. And I will share, because sometimes I, I am of the idea that when you have information, you must not die with that information. The people, be, be, one, one of the few things between the rich and the poor is just the access to information. You know, if you think of someone who is a, actually a billionaire and owning a mine, that person actually had an access to information in terms of how do you go about uh, accessing the, uh, or getting into the mining industry. Another thing I want to emphasize uh, for those uh, first time people who want to get into a property because we are focusing on that one today. Uh, I, I must also accolade the government, more especially the Department of Human Settlement. They've come up with a program called it was previously called Flispine, now it's called uh, First Home Finance. It's for people that are earning from 3.1 to 22,000. So it's a grant, it's a property grant money. You are given that money, it means it's just a gift uh, so that you can be able to uh, mitigate things like a down payment cost. Some people, when they actually approve for a bond, they, they don't understand that they are actually hidden cost in terms of buying uh, property, things like attorney's fee, registration codes, deeds office codes, or sometimes down, down payment. So the first, uh, the first home finance, it's one of those things that we also uh, say a big shout out to the government for coming with that scheme. Obviously it's open for everyone, whether you are white or black, it's just open for South Africans. And we will also encourage people to integrate that if ever they do fall within the range of 3.5 to 22,000, because it will actually give you a boost. It means your bank has approved you maybe 90%, and then the first time uh, finance is actually gonna come in because they can finance or grant you up to 130,000. So it may mean that you can end up owning an asset without even uh, getting some money out of your pocket towards that property ownership. And I must say that if the bond, if the bank approve you uh, the bond ownership, the property is under your name. It's just that they have to keep the, the title deed uh, for security reason. But it's, I'm, I'm of the idea that it's your property and you need to understand how to maximize that property in order to even make more. That's those are other things that I, I hope we will be able to talk and discuss even in the near future. But the most importantly, for first time buyers, for people who want to enter the property space, I will always emphasize this book. Land ownership is ultimate. So if ever even you are no more, 
the land that you own, the piece that you own must not just be the piece of your grave, but it must be something that you can leave for your generation so that they can also continue. That's what other people have done in the past. When you look at other property structures here in the CBD, you can see that maybe the people who started and the ownership has actually passed that property maybe to the second uh, generation or even to the third. So in that way, the structure is there, rentals is coming, then that's, that's how it must always go with each and every one of us. I love it when you talk about rentals. Now let's talk about rentals. Uh, I'm very impressed. Mm -hmm. Most people are renovating their old four-room houses into rental income. Every month. And into Entle, because it's all it also develops the township. It looks nice. Great. And especially nowadays, people are putting in electric fences, um, security cameras, people are giving their tenants Wi-Fi. People are going all out to give uh, I think their tenants, but but in um beautiful, affordable living. Yeah. They give people inferior type of living. So maybe let's focus on, on, on rentals. If I'm um, in my twenties. And then funu kala being advised on yumfana or being hamba na yugu uba. Yimbuza go to u travela ba nangchel go to travela somebody. Nkulman wuguti um when does he want to buy his own car? Angel would know he's on that process of um you know building his balance sheet with the bank. And then uh n sa kala a property. I think Bonilu post and a property man somewhere. How do I get into property? How do we encourage young people in their twenties to start buying their first rental property? And then let's let's get into that um rental conversation. The most important thing, you know, when you're starting working, it means your credit record is still good and fine. Because sometimes if you are starting, you won't have enough capital to buy cash. Ne? So the first thing, make sure your credit score is good and fine. And then even though, even though you are not prepared to have your own property, but as your credit score allows you to get a bond for rental purposes, I'll say do so. For instance, and they are earning good, but they mess up the credit record because they are going for those things that actually de-appreciate in value. And that's exactly what I did. Yes, those then. are the mistakes that I did. Hey. That's why I like it when we are teaching based on some of the mistakes we did. So you yeah. don't have to go through that. And by the way, guys, the biggest mistake you can ever make in this life is to mess up your credit record. Mm. Once you mess up your credit record, it becomes difficult for you to even get money from the bank. It's difficult for you to buy any home. It's difficult for you to buy a car. Your life just becomes difficult because a lot of people, the way they've been able to create wealth is through a good credit record and building a relationship with the bank and actually even ultimately using the bank's money to, ke to keep on appreciating your wealth. It's about other people's money. When we talk about OPM, that is the bank's money, right? Because it gives you leverage. So when you are actually having a good credit record, even though you are interested in a latest car, that is all good and fine. You qualify for it. But let me tell you, if ever you can start and say, okay, let me beat my credit score, and then let me actually apply for a bond, and then you get maybe township property. Let me tell you, township property is always booming. It's one property sector that doesn't necessarily go to recession. I used to do FNP township property barometer, and I will tell you when I list a, a township property, same day I have I will have a buyer because it's the most sought after. I understand. So even in terms of rentals, they are even more affordable, and more especially if ever. Your property, it is in a good route for transport. There are schools around, uh, there are shopping centers around, the hospital is not too far. All those amenities, that's what people want when they are actually looking to rent. And the township property is always um, booming because people, they like the township, ne? Every weekend, sometimes even if they stay in suburbs, but weekends, they go townships. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So that property is actually uh, growing in value now and having, even if it's the big rooms or you are actually renting a room, because if ever you have a spare room, it's a, it has a potential of earning you income through rental. So if you can actually do that, uh, there are... Airbnb in townships. People sometimes, when even they when they visit the country, they want a township experience. You understand to actually revive our tourism. That's one of those few things that we need to do and have like a township hotel whereby anyone will come. They will actually have a different experience in that particular property Airbnb or any kind of PNP. Music. 
That is the life of Lokshi, you understand? And Umuntanga is sounding as Jalaguze Chow Leven and four foot here, because that's how, <laughs> yeah. that's how things happen, you understand? So, guys, we have to make our township economy attractive by actually developing our property, making sure the property is in a sector, you say, Lokshi, it's clean, you take care and you improve. Maybe you are putting aluminum windows uh, when the painting, when the credit be right. So, those are the things that also add value to your property. Once you do it right, even your neighbors will follow through in terms of making sure with your kin to your right. But any things we kizelela as young people or anyone also bugi itu balogunge na gui property gui go emalokshi ni na simakai. Oguti we have to also follow municipality by laws because that is where we are missing it. We find the people utoluguti yes or only for room. Then ufunu go inza ma big rooms without municipalities approval, you understand? Because if ever you are, you are actually uh, wanting to do anything with property, you need to ask for a special permission from your, your municipality because with your property, there are conditions of the title. So if ever you want to extend or change anything, you need to apply for a special approval. Then once you are granted the approval, then you can put your big rooms, you can extend, you can put the double garage and do all sort of things. So that when you are selling your property, you will be selling a property that has been approved in terms of your plan. You understand? Because sometimes uh, when municipality look at your property, it's a, is that a old two room house yeah but you've improved it into a four bedroom and there's also double garage but with a uh, with a town planning and land use management under municipality it still appears as a two 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 bedroom instead of the current four bedroom that you've actually developed so you will have a hindrance if ever you are planning to sell because it will actually be v valued based on what is within the town planning and less use management under your municipality. So we also need to respect the bylaws so that the our properties will actually attract true value all the time and every time. So we've touched on rural property, township property. We will keep on you know, uh, emphasizing on these topics on later dates to come. For now, I want us to go into property stock fields. Yes. All right, that's one of the few things uh, that I always integrate and encourage because that's, that's a collective economy. You know, in South Africa, stock fares makes a la, around 50 billion a year, you know, and uh, we consume like 14 to 18 billion towards, uh, towards uh, food consumption in December alone. And then we consume about around about 30 and above 30 billion towards alcohol during festive season alone. Last year, we spent like 215 billion in one month Yo. towards consumption. You Last know. year, December? Last year, December. 200 billion? 215. South Africans? South Africans. Two. So that includes traveling, tourism, and all those sort of yeah. things. So in South Africa, if stock fails combine, more than 800 uh, stock fails, you can check with Nasasa. If ever, collectively, they put together like 50 billion, and when you look at um, structures like um, big supermarkets, some of them are worth 27 billion. That means South African stock fairs combined can actually buy a certain supermarket chain completely and outright. But if ever we spend like 20 billion as stock fairs buying food for December only, that means we are actually learning to be good consumers instead of good landowners, you know. That's what I always encourage. So that is, let, let us start there in terms of Stockfell, how much they are actually able to put together per year. And tell me, if ever you look at any township mall and check the value of that township mall, that tells me that uh, maybe Tembisa has an economy that can actually buy the, that shopping center outright in one year. But because we are not collective or we are not yet encouraged to focus on group economics, then that is where we are actually missing it. And that's how other uh, structures are planning for us because we are exposed to only consume, not invest. Yeah. All right? So we actually encourage the concept of stock fails as a collective towards buying property. But remember, a stock fail must have a proper constitution. 
proper policy documents uh, that must be followed by every member. Remember, in a Stockfell settings, all members are equal. Whether it's a Stockfell or whatsoever uh, society, all members are equal, have an equal shareholding. You have your treasury, you have your all the committee and management, you have meetings uh, as per the way you can schedule them, you take minutes, all those sort of things. You also have penalties for the members that maybe are behind or actually uh, breaking the rules, like they are no longer able to keep up and so forth. And then the next thing, the potential with the stock fails, they can also uh, rotate the money amongst themselves. Meaning that instead of going to the bank to borrow money, I need to come back as a member and borrow from my stock fails. And then when I pay back, I pay back with interest. That is how we actually grow our collective pot. Then ultimately we can be in a position to buy uh, maybe a property cash outright. I remember uh, from our church setting uh, some six years ago, we started a stock fail for property as 35 members. And uh, in six months, we were able to buy the first apartment for 280. And then we developed that apartment, we subdivided for rentals. The rentals that we were supposed to be getting is like 4,000. But because we do multi rentals, we are able to get uh, 12,000 as a student accommodation every month. All right. Uh, two and a half years later, we we're able to buy the second one. And it takes us two and a half years to break even, meaning that to bring back the money that we've actually spent buying the structure. And the structure is also growing in value because we are actually taking good care of it and we are actually making sure that we preserve the value. You see. So it means every two years we are able to buy a property cash, we meaning that we hold title deeds. That's what we actually do as a collective. So even for an individual who has actually uh, maybe a street vendor, but because you are now part of the collective, you are able to actually benefit uh, from rental income. We are able to benefit from dividends that we do as a society come the end of the financial year. That's what we encourage. But as an individual, you may not be in a position to do it. But as a collective, at least you have set your foot in and then you will be able to progress. Come five years to ten years later, you will be far ahead than if you have not started. That's what we encourage group and collective economics. That's what will actually make us as township people, as black people, to be in a position to be able to take some ownership, one piece of land at a time, but progressively we will get to that. That's what I will always emphasize and encourage all the time. How big is the Stockfell industry in the country? For now, it's uh, at uh, an infancy. It's starting to grow, but uh, it's not yet there because people are actually not exposed in terms of how to actually craft the constitution and the policy document that actually pertains uh, the collective and group economics. That's one of the few things. So it is still at an infancy, but you can see the banks are actually seeing that people are actually doing things now as a crowd. That is why they've positioned themselves to set up Stockfell's accounts. So you can come and say, okay, you are coming as a committee that has been nominated, you submit your, you submit your constitution, and then they can actually open a stock file account for you as a group, and then they will also help with doing financials for you. So when it comes to the meeting time and the uh, um, reporting, financial report uh, meetings, you actually get everything combined, the cash flow, uh, the balance sheet, and all those sort of things you are able to, pro to actually present accordingly because that transparency is also needed. So it's a growing environment that we always encourage all the time. And uh, if you see uh, people like Asians, when they come in, they do the same method uh, in terms of buying those uh, downtown structures, then they change it, they call it like China City, China Plaza, but they do that as a collective. So that's one we also uh, encourage for us, that as, as people from township and rural space, as a collective we can do something, other than being consumers of people coming out to establish establishments in our settings, and we again become their consumers. That's how we need to shift our mindset and paradigm. In that way, we can start little by little, but we can get into the space and start to grow and establish ourselves from there. The Property Talk Show is proudly brought to you by EKC Noble Property Development. They've got opportunities in Ranfontein at a suburb called Green Hills and another suburb called Robin Park. They also have got opportunities in Bears, Nodier, Krugersdorp, and another exciting development that's coming up called Ngonyama Lifestyle Estate at North Riding Equestrian. 
Pedestrian Estate. Get in touch with them on 079-275-8821. That is Ekasi Noble Property Development. Let's talk about interest rates. Ish, smooth. <laughs> Yesterday, interest rate went up again. You know, yeah. I, was, I was projecting at least 25 basis point. Yeah. Ish, the Reserve Bank said 50. Yeah. Already people are struggling. I'm telling you, already people are struggling. Another, another guy is, is calling me and saying, uh, Sponiso, um, my 2 million rent property, I was like paying like 16,000. But now I'm paying 21,000. That's excluding rates, obviously. And now you are paying like 6,000 to 7,000 more for a 2 million property from 2021 November till now. So from today, effect from today, interest rate are now 11.25% when we include prime. That is a, a heavy blow. And it's, it's been a surprise for us when we analyze because we're really projecting at least 25 basis point to 20 to 11%. We're actually in a reception. In, oh, sorry, we're actually in a recession. Yeah, that's a that, soft recession as they would call it. That's heavy for us because normally we look at what the US is doing and the UK. So if they raise interest rate, we are bound to do it because if we don't, even the work, the rent will even become weaker and then that will also drive inflation up. So to mitigate against that, so they are forced to raise what? Uh, inflation, I mean uh, interest rate. So, ish, you know what? Now in the property setting and environment, that's, that's uh, really hard for the last two years. Uh, for, for property owners there, it's really hard. But remember, you are able to negotiate even interest rate with your bank. You go back, you actually be blunt and honest with them. Look, I'm struggling at this 11.25%. Uh, uh, if ever you can be fair enough, I've been faithful, I've been the client here, maybe I have an investment, because you must actually convince them, negotiate. Even though the banks are making it harder to actually communicate it directly with people who have a mandate to make decisions. Sometimes when you actually approach your bank, they will actually give you a telephone and say you will speak to someone who is in the call center. Those people, they do not have a mandate to even listen and take a decision. But you need to find someone whom you can sit down and actually negotiate your interest rate. Negos the interest rate are negotiable. I always tell people that sometimes you will actually have your colleague who are white and saying, I'm not paying 11.25, I'm paying 9.75 because I negotiated. You will think it's a skin color issue. No, it's not. It's because they actually negotiated. If ever that particular bank of yours is not willing to actually come down or accommodate you, you can actually go to the competitor and ask them if ever I transfer, I transfer my bond from bank A to bank B, can you actually consider giving me a reasonable interest rate? If they do so, you also negotiate if ever maybe they can uh, absorb some transfer cost because even when you transfer from one uh, bank to the other in terms of open, there are those smaller yana fees that you will also need to pay. But others, they can say we will waiver uh, to accommodate you. So you must play around that game because there's no bank that wants to lose a property client to the competitor. So when you are negotiating, do not believe or approach bank as a religion. Tell them that I'm also here a client bringing you money. Do you want my money to be taken by your competitor or you want us to sit and negotiate? That's one of the few things you need to do. Because now the, really the interest rates are up. If you are not negotiating, then try to look at maybe adding a certain amount if you are still affording to do so. Like a, a hundred rand extra in terms of your property payment, it can go a long way towards minimizing your capital. That's one of the few things I also encourage. But some people do add on their bond, but they forget to, to instruct the bank what to do with that additional amount. Because if you don't instruct them or communicate, they will actually create a small savings account for you and keep that money there. And then it's not actually capitalizing for you. And what should, what should you say to them? What sh how should you instruct them? You, you actually send them an email and give them a call that every little amount that I actually add must be allocated to capital. You put that in writing every month. And then you also have your bond in your app. You can look into your app and check how it's actually making a difference. That's one of the few things that uh, our good people need to understand. Communication with the bank is very much important because you are not like uh, someone who's, who must be silent. They are not doing a favor. They are actually getting a good business from you. That is why you must also negotiate a business with them. That's one of the few things that are important, communication. 
All right, let's move now to um, real estate. Oh, we spoke about rights, ne? Yeah. rights which would be um, real estate investment trust. We spoke about property stock files, property collective buying. We spoke about that property as an asset to create wealth. You know, it's important for people to understand that it is not every time when property is a good investment. There's a time where you can get into a property and find yourself losing money. That's very much important. So we always say when you are considering buying property, it's location, location, and location. location. That's very much important. So if ever you come because you are driven by a hype and a desire to own, but you do not do a proper study or get a good, complete advisory in terms of property buying and stuff, you may end up uh, getting bent uh, in the process, you know. So, the first thing that you need to understand, yes, property is an asset, but sometimes it can be, uh, um, it can take money out of your pocket and make you, it, it can bankrupt you, that's what I mean. So, when you are buying a property, maybe let's say it's a, obviously an affordable property, but there is actually a vacant land around where people may create some cuckoo or, uh, you know, those uh, street people can just come and commit crime, that will actually drive the value down instead of driving the value up. up. So when you are looking at the area, uh, check even the level of crime, all right, around that area. Check the level of uh, municipal services. If ever that area is not attended to, is not well serviced, it may not attract the value towards your property. So that, uh, that is an instance where property cannot be a good investment, where it can actually make you lose money. The second thing you need to understand, you can buy property with an aim of uh, renting it out. And you'll find yourself that maybe you've, you've bought in a building that is already owing rates and all those sort of things. Meaning that you didn't do proper study, you didn't even check financials, audited financials for that matter before you even buy. But uh, coming to the uh, understanding of looking at the property as an asset, you need to know that every time property is not necessarily a house. Property is land. A house is more like a tattoo on your body. All right. What is registered at the deeds office is actually what? Is actually the land, the size of the land, the conditions of the title, what you can do with that land, what you cannot do, the zoning of that particular land. That is the actual property. All right. So now what you do in that property can determine the value going up or the value declining, okay? So property is always what I call an asset if you build it to be an asset. But if you do not understand it as an asset, it's not. For instance, if I buy a house, then and stay, it's not necessarily an asset because it's, actual, it's me who is actually spending money, all right? But if I buy a property and then I start to rent it out, then that is where it's becoming what? An asset because it's bringing me money. But if it's ever it's just my house and then I'm staying there, it's, it's more like a liability because it's not bringing me money. And even if it actually rise in value, come 20 years, you've actually completely paying your bond. You need to calculate that for a 600,000 uh, property, you will actually pay like 1.3 to 1.4 million in 20 years. Because for the first 13 years, you are more like paying interest. And then from there, you will be starting to attack the capital, okay? So even if your value of your property is at the range of uh, 1.5 million after 20 years, then you also count the cost of owning, how much you've paid already in the 20 years. Then in that sense, it's no longer what? An asset, because you were paying money, you were to, it was not bringing in money. It's only an asset if ever I'm setting up something that I can rent it out. It can be rentals, it can be bedrooms, it can be parking, it can be any other thing that has to do with land and any structure that can be created in that land for the purpose of rentals. Then in that sense, it's an asset because it's bringing money. But if your property is actually bleeding you money, it's not a, an, an asset, it's a liability. That is the difference you need to know. Because some people may just jump in because of the hype, because they want to own property for the sake of owning property, not looking at if this pro, I, if I own this property, how is it good? Excuse, how is it going to generate me some cash 
and all that stuff, you know. That's one of those few things that people need to understand. A property as an asset. Can I buy property without a single cent in my pocket? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can, you know. Like, for instance, obviously you still have to pay um, the bond repayments. For instance, there are banks that can actually give you what we call 100% bond, all right? That means I've got like 100% from the bank, but I still need to cough a little bit in terms of down payment cost, like registration fee, attorney's fees, and all those sort of things. If ever you manage to get a grant, that means you will have property ownership without buying, I mean, paying a cent. That's one of those few things you need to understand. And then you can get into the game, obviously you start to be paying bond repayments, all right? There are other complicated strategies, obviously, um, whereby you can try, but you need to start and do your homework to understand how can I go about um, uh, uh, do this thing that um, no money till down. You know, there were instances where people can actually uh, uh, put uh, the offer uh, with um, maybe 60 days, all right? Offer that will be valid for 60 days. It means if ever I have a 500,000 property and then I put an offer and I have 60 days, all right, to get the funding, whether from the bank or raise funds for that, all right? So in that 60 days, that means that a sale is pending. And if ever I can get an investor who can actually come in with me towards the, that, 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 that property. I can get into that property with other people's money. Those are investors that I can come in and have a joint uh, partnership and say, look, I have this offer standing. I've put an offer, but I'm, I need 500,000 more. Even though the property is 500,000, but because now I have an offer in place uh, that is standing, and that will actually be non-existent if 60 days come and I'm not able to realize the funds, you know. Sometimes you can work on the things like that. There were instances where people put an offer and try to also market that particular property at a higher rate, all right? Meaning that you can make some smaller yana money of which is a difference. If you look at um, uh, property platforms, you can see one property listed for 500,000 and the next property, same property listed for 700,000. It's because someone is trying to play the game in between. You understand? So that's one of those few things. Is that allowed? It's, it's, it's not illegal. So meaning that I have a valid uh, offer in place that I've actually put, all right? But at the very same time, I will actually put it on the documentation that uh, uh, because it's a suspensive clause, meaning that come the uh, if 60 days exhaust, then the deal is off. If I'm not able to find uh, an investor, if the bank is not approving me, the deal is off. So that's, there's nothing illegal there. When you are taking it to register at a deed's office, it will be like a double registration. On the same day, it will be transferred to SBU, and the next moment it will be transferred back to me, and you are left maybe with 50, 100,000 after time and payment costs. People have been doing that for quite some time. No damage, but people need to be aware as well. Because sometimes there are also many other property scams that can make you like lose a whole lot of money. I had one person who inboxed me via Facebook and say I've been a victim of a property scam where I've even paid 250000 for a property that was advertised on a classified. And I even went and viewed the property because other people can take advantage and see like um, a property who is not occupied and take pictures and list the property on these private social uh, platforms. <laughs> and you go there and you just say, no, this is the property. And they will also show you the property. Sometimes they come as if they are viewers themselves. You understand? So there are many other things that's been going left instead of right when it comes to property uh, sales. That is why when you are actually dealing with properties, you must deal with a registered uh, property practitioner with a valid FFC. You must also double check that. So when you are actually dealing with someone who buys or to sell you a property as an agent, you are required to request a valid FFC document that actually shows that this person is actually uh, registered to conduct the transaction 
of this particular property or any property that is in the market. That is another very important point. How does your um, property portfolio look like? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. Uh, and I must be honest, currently, uh, because on the other side we develop, ne? when we develop, we simply develop with the aim of selling. Sometimes we develop, we actually sell off plan because we are also uh, an HPRC license. So someone, we can actually have a plan approved by the municipality. An individual can go to the bank and come back. The banks will be paying us in different phases. And then we complete, we hand over, we're done. You understand? But currently, I must quite be honest, I'm standing on three rental properties. I'm still growing, you know. Nice. But they are fully paid up, owning title deeds. That's the met. Wow, you understand? Nice. But on the other side, we are just... Um, uh, developing with an aim of like selling and uh, the beautiful thing is that uh, we don't deal with you you go to the bank the bank approve you and they approve the plan in place then we get money directly from the bank in different phases we are covered we hand over uh, come the inspectors certify everything thumbs up we're done we sorted Mr. Mchali Nyabonga Putuam Thank you Razo I'm looking forward <laughs> to having you back this was an incredible beginners conversation I would like for you to say your last words to the people out there especially those who are first-time homeowners um, or looking into buy and those who want to get into property investment. Your last words to them. You can look at which camera should you look at? That one over right. there. Yeah. Uh, Sbu, before, before, before I say that, yeah. in 60 seconds, I, I will start and appreciate you because you open opportunities for many youngsters. You know, sometimes on Twitter we hashtag DJ Sbu and then we actually market our business. That's how you, how you are actually creating value amongst us as, a, as young people. We really appreciate that. But I cannot come into a present of great men and not identify myself with your success. You understand? I'm a money person, I'm a financial plan, I'm doing my postgrad towards financial planning, you understand? But sometimes we don't come back to say thank you. You know, for that reason. For that reason, it's Buddha. Uh, I don't know how much I have in the bag, but I always believe in giving, you understand? I know if I give you 10,000 right now, it's gonna be like a drop in an ocean when it's compared to something you have. But please accept that from me as a token of appreciating you as someone who always open opportunities for us, you understand? So it's a city that I saw towards uh, recognizing your success. I always say, when you see people who are successful, don't curse them. Don't say in yoga or ritual. Identify with that particular success. When you see someone driving a nice car in your street, you need to understand that now the blessing is in my street. I am the next to be successful because I can recognize the success in my township. That's one of the few things that you need to understand. But every day learn something, visit uh, sources that are educational. Whether you want to learn into property, get into property, learn about it. Anything that you need to understand, the money will always be attracted to the knowledge you have about it. The more you accumulate understanding and knowledge about money, the more it gets attracted to you. It's all about that. Money is attracted to good ideas, money is attracted to good knowledge. That is my last word. Thank you, Sbuda. Ah, uh, I'm faith. You're amazing, poet. Thank you, thank you. Kulungu la kubega njia la kubusi some poet. I love the spirit of wanting to share knowledge na bantu bagit. Create my brand. And of helping people understand money so they can create their wealth and but create a legacy for inga nza. Number one. Se abong msebenzo akum poet. Thank you, se abong. And I'm finally happy that I, I'm, I've met you in person. Hey. I'm one of your students <laughs> now, I'm sure. Yeah, thank you a lot. And um, most definitely, we'll always avail ourselves to be part of any engagement that is progressive, that is towards empowering and uh, enriching our society. I'm very much happy for that. Thanks for the opportunity. What are the books that are out there and any upcoming seminars maybe that you are doing? All right, uh, tomorrow we are doing a free one. Um, it's gonna be via Zoom. Obviously on Zoom we can accommodate up to 300 people, but others can check. Our, our Facebook page is uh, Money Republic. Uh, please follow it. Follow it. We've got like 60 followers because there are those people who also create fake accounts, you know. So, uh, yeah, so small numbers is not our account. So we'll also be broadcasting live. Uh, other than that, uh, next week is the Passover. We have nothing planned for that other than going and praise the Lord. And then after that, we we'll resume the schedule. But we always put it uh, in good terms. And um, we, we also have a challenge. That is starting on Monday. It's going to be online as well. We call it Financial Market Challenge, where we are actually uh, teaching people how to actually taking advantage 
of the financial markets. Uh, there are many opportunities that are there, but all the information, you can check it on our Facebook page, Money Republic, you can subscribe. You can check it on our uh, TikTok, it's also Money Republic, at Twitter, at Money Republic, all across. Thank you so much. God bless you. The great Bonisom Chile, an amazing brother, and I'm humbled to have met him. I'm looking forward to learning from him. He will definitely be back on the platform, and we'll also bring him more on the platform to just speak about money, not only property, because that's how much knowledge he has. And sometimes I'll share his Let's <laughs> the Property Talk Show has been proudly brought to you by Ekasi Noble Property Development. See you on the next episode. Thank you.